Hello and welcome to the video. Today we're going to look into working with spectrum analyzers. And in particular, I've got here Keysight EXA M9010B. This is a fairly expensive spectrum analyzer, but for this matter you could use any other model. And I'll show you the basic principles of working with spectrum analyzers so that you can follow it in your lab or even at home if you want to. For the purposes of this video, we're going to need the following. A low noise amplifier, which in this case is a little bit homemade, but you can see the part numbers that are used inside, and it gives about 35 decibels of gain. Very important, on its input it's got a DC block. Without it, you can damage your spectrum analyzer, which is not a good idea. This is a long coaxial cable that we're going to use to connect our spectrum analyzer to the low noise amplifier. But to connect the antenna to the low noise amplifier, we're going to use a short coaxial cable. And this is something that you want to do. You want to keep your low noise amplifier close to the source. Then finally, we're going to need our near field probes. And those are very important. The specific model is Regal NFP, but you can of course design your own or even use wire for this matter. They come from very small sizes to slightly larger ones. And the size of magnetic loop matters because you can capture low frequencies better with larger loops. And of course you will see more effects of them when we look at it. When you first turn on your spectrum analyzer, it will look something like this, which is not going to be particularly useful. So I'm going to show you how to get a little bit more useful information out of it. First, let's connect our setup. Make sure it's very tight and it's not loose. On the other side of the cable, we're going to connect it to the output of the low noise amplifier, which has a DC block on it. Then the input to noise amplifier is going to be this short cable. And on the other side, we're going to connect it to a magnetic loop. This is the adapter you use if you would want to connect an off-the-shelf antenna to it, which is something else that you may want to do, and I'll show it a bit later. Yeah, maybe like this. Yeah, perfect. Now we're ready to start working with the spectrum analyzer. First of all, let's change the frequency to something that's a bit more interesting to us. For example, 300 megahertz, and we finish at 600 megahertz. Oh dear. Okay. Then we're going to go into bandwidth settings, and as you can see, hopefully, the bandwidth is by default set to 3 MHz. What bandwidth really means is the resolution at which spectrum analyzer is scanning the spectrum. So 3 MHz is pretty large. It is useful when you're doing a global scan of the entire spectrum between let's say 100 MHz to 5 GHz. But for the frequency that we have selected, this is definitely an overkill. So we're going to reduce that bandwidth to 100 kHz. And sometimes you may want to reduce it even further because you may be looking at a specific spike or something like that. Next, we're going to go into amplitude and we're going to add an offset to compensate for the gain in low noise amplifier. And I know that this is going to be about 37 decibels of gain. And we're going to change the reference level so that we can see it better. It is worth also noting that by default the spectrum analyzer will have 10 decibels of attenuation, which is required not to damage the spectrum analyzer. And you may or may not want to remove that, but if you do remove that and set it to 0 dB, you have to be extra careful. So in general it's a good idea to leave it in. Then after we've done that we can go to the trace window 
and we will change it to trace average. So now we're talking and we can see our noise flow with pretty much terminated input. So our next step is to actually power up the low noise amplifier. And if we've done everything correctly, we should see the noise increase when we do that. As you can see, it is rising. So what it means is that the low noise amplifier is now our noise flow and we're not dealing with the noise of the spectrum analyzer. So this is below the noise flow, so we don't see it. The reason it's coming up slowly is because we have 100 measurements to take. And you can play with this value to change the average hold number to say 50 so that it becomes a bit faster. If you don't want to wait too long, you can click restart. And this is going to do it again. This is effectively what we see here, is the ambient noise floor as captured by the spectrum analyzer. And if you want to study those peaks, you can have a look at them by clicking peak search or going into market details. And you can see all those frequencies, which are probably the LTE kind of frequencies that we would normally expect. I'm going to change this number back to 100 because I like when it's precise. So now that it finished running and we captured the ambient noise flow, what I usually do is I save this trace. And to save this trace, I change it from active to view. And now this trace is not going to change. What we're gonna do next we're going to add another trace, make it active, and again, trace average. So by doing that, we can now compare results before and after. So now, we're going to look into the device under test. And in this example, I'm simply going to use the audio interface that I've got, which is Sono by Audient. It has passed EMC before, and it should be pretty good, but with a near field probe, you can see emissions coming in a near field. So there's going to be difference between the emissions you see in the far field. And when we test devices for EMC, we only test them in the far field. We don't consider near field. So you will typically see a lot of stuff, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your product is bad. What it means is that it's alive and the circuitry is working. So let's have a look. And just as we can start looking at it, you can see that the noise is beginning to rise. As I'm moving my probe, the noise goes higher or lower. So this place here is not so bad. But when we look here, we definitely can see increase in noise. So this could potentially mean that there is a little hole in this area and the noise is poking through. Or for example, around here. Next, I'm going to select a new marker so that it's reassigned to the new trace and find the nearest peak. So you can see that at 565-25 MHz we've got a significant peak and also you can see that there is a quite an increase in the lower noise flow, but otherwise this device is pretty quiet because you would expect to see, if, if it was failing EMC, you would expect to see noise much higher than that. So, of course, in this example, I'm not specifically looking for anything, whereas you really should. Um, and when you know that you're failing at a specific frequency, for example, if we knew that we're failing EMC at 500 65.25 megahertz then we would be looking for it and we would know that at this specific point it's leaving our device so then we can capture this trace and just change it to view again and we can enable a new trace so then we can look at another area you know, and we can capture the fo noise footprint, for example, at DI input. 
or at headphone output and so on and so forth like I said earlier it's worth trying different probes as well so we can switch to the very big probe and see what's happening then so let's have a look let's just head straight to the same area and as you can see the noise footprint is quite different this doesn't mean that there's like anything specific about it but you should try different probes just to see the spike that you're looking for because sometimes it will look in different ways what we can do to analyze this further is to narrow the bandwidth to a much smaller frequency so for example let's get rid of traces 1 and 2 now we just have trace 2 so we can go into frequency again and just make it a bit smaller so for example between 3 and so hold on a second let's say between 400 and 450 this is good because you can now see the ripples of the power supply and this is a nice trick you can use to identify which power supply is causing this ripple what you do to do that is you set another marker so this is our peak that we can see, but we really want to go to one of the small ones. And what we want to do is to switch marker from normal operation to delta operation. So now we're measuring the distance between markers 3 and 4. So when we go to the next one, we can see that they only separated by 850 kilohertz. This quite probably is the frequency of our power supply that's causing this emission, or it could be the harmonic of it. So for example, it could be 2.6 megahertz or any other related number. So this is something you have to always check when you find multiple peaks. You have to check the distance between them and uh, run through the numbers from your block diagram to see whether it matches with any of the clocks that you have on a printed circuit board because for example uh, 49 megahertz clock can generate harmonics up to gigahertz region and uh, you will only see a specific number so you wouldn't necessarily figure out whether it's related or not until you divide this number by 49 megahertz and then you see that if the number is equal that must be the harmonic of that clock you can also tell that this noise is quite clearly related to the power supply because of its shape when you look at the clock it will look quite different and I'll try to find that in a minute but this we call power supply rasters and this is a piece of terminology that you sometimes will hear in a ref world if someone asks you to look for power supply rasters then this is what they mean so as promised here's an example of a clock and you can see that this is a clock by its shape it's much taller and wider than the power supply so you can easily identify a clock from a power supply raster another very useful piece of kit to have is an RF shielding box and what that's being used for is to isolate your circuitry from external noise so to show you an example of how it works we can capture the noise footprint before and after closing this box and it is as simple as that it's just a metal box really and on the back you have a little bit of space to insert your cables and if you want to wrap it up in foil that's a good thing to do as well so if we want to go back to our previous example and set the frequency range to be between 350 and 600 megahertz this is going to be the noise footprint we captured with the box fully open as you can see 
and it has just a probe inside of it. So now I'm going to freeze this trace and switch to trace 2. Therefore, when I close the box, I should be able to see the difference. So now we can start seeing that there is actually quite a difference in some frequencies, but not so much in others. And this is something that you would expect. After all, my low noise amplifier is still outside of the box, and if I were to move it inside, maybe it would be better. So let's do that. So this is the capture without low noise amplifier inside the box. Let's save this trace. and go back to trace 1. So here it is. Everything is tucked in and all cables are inside. So now let's close the box. And in fact we can see the difference again. So as a reminder, the purple trace is with the near field probe outside of the box, the blue trace is with the near field probe inside the box, and the yellow trace is now with the both near field probe and the noise amplifier inside the box. So this is actually an example from a real world kind of product debugging scenario, and you can clearly see that we have issues on this product with some peaks going here and there. And if you, if you were to calculate the delta frequency between those two, you would see that this is 25.8 megahertz. And I know that this is a frequency of uh, one of the ICs inside this product. And at the moment I'm testing literally with the antenna outside of the product completely so I can see that those frequencies are poking out quite a lot so there's a, that's a good indication and you can definitely see that they are clocks just from this shape you know it's really it's really definitive shape for a clock signal what else I wanted to show you is that you can also create a peak table and that's a very useful thing to do so if we go to peak search config on this analyzer and this is how it's going to look like so it automatically identifies all kinds of different peaks and we can now export that by clicking save and saving this as a measurement data in the peak table and this is going to be um, CSV file so we can later open it in Excel and uh, obviously we'll see all the pics um, and uh, whilst on it if you want to take a screenshot that would be screen image and you just have to specify the path to your USB stick and then you click save so that's pretty much all I want to show in this video. This video aims to show you the setup that you would need to investigate EM issues on a spectrum analyzer. However, it really is important to know what you're looking for, rather than just randomly looking at near-field performance of a device, which is not always representative of its far-field performance. So I highly encourage you to do the far-field scan first, and then you find out that you have a problem, or if you don't have a problem, then why bother with all of this? Once you do know where the problem is, you can start looking with a spectrum analyzer at identifying its exact location. This video gives you some basic information to start debugging circuits uh, by yourself. I wish I've seen this video before myself because I've always been doing a lot of mistakes with it this type of setup. I hope you enjoyed this video and it's giving you some useful information for how to practically debug circuits using spectrum analyzers and please like and subscribe the channel and I'll see you in the next video very soon.